Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host tonight, John Mark Grodi, and we're bringing to you another a story, a story of conversion, a story of what the Lord has done in our lives, how the, the gospel, the good news has played out uh, in one of our lives. We are joined tonight by Katie Jacobson, former evangelical Protestant. Uh, Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you. I know that that's a very short moniker <laughs> of, uh, of a long story with many yep. circuitous twists and turns. Yeah. But thank you for being here tonight to thank share you. your story. Thank so. you. So I'll step way back. Okay. Where, where does it all begin? Um, it begins way back into my childhood. Um, I was raised ELC Lutheran by okay. my mom. And it was only my mom bringing me to church. And church for our house was something that was just a burden. Um, and I always knew when it was Communion Sunday. We had it once a month. And I knew because there would be extra stomping and swearing in the <laughs> house because my mom was so angry that we'd be another 15 minutes delayed mm. getting out of church. And so finally, when I got a little older, I said, you know, I, I love God. You love God. Why do we even go to church? Like, clearly you hate it. I don't like it. And she said, well, what would people think? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what church was for me growing up. Um, interestingly enough, I can look back and see that I prayed a lot. I prayed all the time to God. Mm -hmm. I always knew he was with me. I felt his presence. Um, so I, it, it's, it's just so interesting to look back on that and know yeah. how close he was to me in that. But that was my understanding of faith basically at mm -hmm. the time. It was someone I prayed to occasionally. Um, he saw me when I was bad and kind of a scary guy in the sky and church was horrible. Mm -hmm. But then when I was 16, uh, my parents were going through a divorce. I was getting ready to switch schools. There's this big upheaval in my life. And I stayed after school with some other kids to study for math. and you know, all of us, we obviously weren't very good at math. So we were trying to distract the teacher. And one of the kids asked the teacher, he said, hey, what's the difference between Methodists and Lutherans and Catholics? Like, why are there these different churches if they're all Christian? Why aren't they just church? And I kind of perked up then because I thought, yeah, that, why question. haven't I thought of that before? Yeah. You know, like, why, why is that? Why do we have these differences? And he gave a vague answer and kind of got back to work. But then afterwards, he pulled me aside and he said, it looked like you might want to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, sure, that's fine. I'll, I'll hear more about it. And he sat me down and it was like a three hour conversation. Wow. He, he started out with, are you a Christian? Oh, of course I'm a Christian. I sometimes go to church. Uh, once I tried to read the Bible, it was very boring, but I tried. <laughs> so obviously, yeah, I'm a Christian. And so he started to explain to me what a Christian was, belief in God, and he gave me the sinner's prayer mm. to go home and pray. And I didn't realize it was the sinner's prayer, um, but if I read a few of these verses, John 3.16 being one of them, mm -hmm. I'd never heard of that before. Um, and if I felt so inclined, then, then here was this prayer. And so I prayed that prayer that night. And, and truly the Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. And suddenly I was reading the Bible with this hunger that I had never experienced before. This book wow. that didn't make sense before mm -hmm. was coming to life before my eyes. And I think it was like three in the morning before I finally closed the Bible and made myself go to sleep for school the next mm -hmm. day. Um, and so that's where the real awakening spiritually yeah. started because of my algebra teacher. Yeah. And um, I went to school and, and he practically threw a cartwheel when I said, yes, I'd, I'd done that prayer. And so I didn't realize the importance at the time, but as I grew older, I saw it. So the church I started going to with him and his wife was actually a Baptist church mm -hmm. and um, different, very different from the Lutheran church I'd been raised in. Right. And this was kind of my journey into the evangelical realm. Um, so I went to that church for quite a few years and I ended up getting married, well, I'd, I'd gotten pregnant and gotten married um, very much out of a, a misunderstanding of Christ, like, I have to do the right thing, um, you know, and really where I was mm. coming from, I didn't know what a sacrament was. Um, sacrament's not a word we use in the evangelical churches. And so it was like, well, out of duty and for God to not hate me, I need to get married. Mm. Um, not the best theology, you know? Right. And really my understanding of theology is is the one and done attitude of once saved, always saved. I said that sinner's prayer, so no matter what I'm saved. So I, I was trying to do the right thing sure. with just a very poor theology. Um, and so 
life started going downhill pretty quickly with that. And I had a severe drinking problem. Um, all of these things kind of pointed me to, I think I need a little more in my life other than just, I have prayed the sinner's prayer. Yeah. I think maybe I should study the Bible a little bit and get more knowledge. And as I was studying it on my own, I realized I needed some guidance. So I had plans to become a mortician. And I thought, well, there's a little Bible college in town. I'll go and get some basics and then I'll transfer to the U of M and I'll, I'll be a mortician. Um, so I, I enrolled in this little tiny Bible college that no one's ever heard of, Crossroads College in Rochester, Minnesota. And it, it changed my theological world upside down. Mm -hmm. um, it was amazing the things that I was learning and every day I would leave class with just red cheeks and red ears and just the spirits buzzing and mm. it was just this high that I'd never experienced and I thought this is it. Theology is where it's at and this has got my heart. And so I ended up um, going to school not for to be a mortician but for theology mm -hmm. and loved it. Um, and I was very well formed there uh, but I hated Catholicism with a passion. Huh. Um, I kind of make the quip that if you're a good Protestant, you hate the Catholic Church. Mm. Um, I mean, Protestant, you're protesting. protesting yeah. You are protesting the Catholic Church. And one of my teachers even said at one point, if you're going to call yourself a Protestant, you have to know what you're protesting. Mm. And we we're like, yeah, <laughs> like we all know. Um, but that very same teacher, he had a huge impact on my journey to the Catholic Church. Um, you know, at one point he mentioned his wife was Catholic and all of us, our jaws hit the floor mm. because what Bible-believing Christian would ever marry a Catholic? That is not done, you don't do that. And so there's this uncomfortable silence as we try to come to grips with how does a marriage like that even work? Um, we'd met other believers who you know, their spouse had been raised Catholic and they got married and, you know, they just kind of left the Catholic Church behind and that was fine, that's okay, but his wife was actively Catholic. And so it was just a very horrifying concept for us and they were going to raise their children Catholic, mm. which we saw as a death sentence. Like, why would you condemn your children to hell like that? Um, and so that's what he was working with, yeah. with all of us because we all had very similar backgrounds. Um, but my path, to the Catholic Church began in college and in that formation because there were things I was starting to see. Um, we had a, a class on Romans, an entire semester on Romans, and I could see where Paul was saying over and over again, be unified, be unified, be unified. And I could look around the classroom I was in, half of us were getting ready to go plant churches in whatever denomination, you know, make up our own denomination or, you know, borrow off of somebody else. And so I didn't see us coming together. I saw us drifting apart more. And I thought, well, that's not right. That's not what we're mm. learning. And I would talk to people about um, my, my experiences with worship were beginning to bother me because I loved it. I loved worship. The smoke machines and the electric guitars, like it was a blast and you could feel the Holy Spirit and you're just so moved. Um, but then I would notice too, if they played a new song that I didn't know, I felt nothing. I'm like, how is it that the Holy Spirit's only working through songs I know? Right. And well, that's odd. And then it, we, we would talk about dead churches in town. And so I would naturally go to those churches to see what made them dead. And it would be the same sermon, the mm -hmm. same great theology in the sermon, but the music might have been, you know, three old ladies in a choir. So it just wasn't. I don't know, powerful to us. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, we're being emotionally manipulated. And to realize that was very hurtful. Mm. And, and I thought, but it's, it's not that music is bad. Um, how do I come to terms yeah. with this? Yeah, um, you may have, what do you make of it? Yeah. Right, yeah. And, and does that mean the church is dead? Because shouldn't we be able to have church without music at all? Mm. And God speaks. So there were, there were some things that I was wrestling with and I began to start to say, you know, I'm sad and disappointed because I really hoped there was a one true church, all these denominations, there's gotta be a one true church, but 
I'm seeing through our fragmentation and our splintering that we've lost that. We've messed it up. There's no such thing as one true church anymore. And also hurtful to really discover that. And one of my friends made me very upset because when I said that to him, he said, you're so postmodern. And we'd been learning <laughs> about that in school. And it felt like a kick in the gut because I could hear it when he said that. Um, that's what we were being created to be soldiers against is this postmodern society that says there's no truth. There's no true church. Um, is there even a God? Like, that's what we're prepping for is to go out into the world and be soldiers for Christ. Yeah. But then here I am saying, like, we've just messed it all up so badly. And so I'm like, am I any better than the world I'm trying to evangelize to? Am I just contributing to the mess? So it was very, very messy. Mm -hmm. And so at about that time is when I started going to what I would call RCIA equivalent mm -hmm. classes in a lot of different denominations right. because I had to figure out which one was right. One of us has to at least have the most of. And at the time I was like, well, the evangelicals have it the most right, but I better double check. Um, so I did go through those classes in several different denominations and they all had tidbits that I thought were great, um, tidbits that were wonderful. How do you decide? Um, and one of the things in the news at the time when I was in, in the Bible college was Westboro Baptist. Mm. And so I'm seeing in the media on, on this side of the spectrum, you have openly gay women pastors. Right. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have Westboro Baptist and what they're saying. And then everything in between. And it's like, we're all claiming the authority of the Holy Spirit. All of us are. But I know the Holy Spirit's not contradicting himself in this. We so it just, I felt so lost in it mm -hmm. um, right when I felt like I should be most confident. Right. Um, so as I said, I started those classes. I started going around to different denominations. Um, I had some questions about Mormons. Um, and funny, funny enough, uh, Mormons came and knocked on my door <laughs> at the time. And I was a single mom of two girls. And so I said, come on in, like, let's chat. You know, I'm not gonna be baptized, I, but I just wanna know. I wanna know why you call yourselves, you know, Latter-day Saints of Jesus Christ being in their title, mm -hmm. but yet my Christian friends say you're not Christian. And I ended up spending a couple of years with the Mormons. Um, I never converted, I never desired to convert. Um, although part of that's a lie. I had a huge heart for the Mormons. Yeah. They are a terrific community. And part of me was almost lamenting the fact that I was so grounded in my theology mm -hmm. because I thought if I didn't know all this stuff about God and theology, I would be a Mormon right. and I would love that community and I would be taken care of by them. So, um, but that was also very necessary for me to see when the Catholics treated me so well, mm. I knew I wasn't becoming Catholic just for the community. So that was a very good test for me with the Mormons. We're talking tonight to Katie Jacobson, a former evangelical Protestant, yeah, that is really interesting about the yeah, the Mormons, right? We we the ones we've talked to and we've experienced, right? They have a great sense of community, mm -hmm. and and sometimes we experience that in in other Christian denominations that they've got they got a piece of this. Yeah, they do it really well. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's like we would say it's not the fullness, like that. There's there's a lot mm -hmm. of issues there, but uh, certainly they got that piece really well, and it's not insignificant. Right. And so when you, it's it's important that we <laughs> that yeah. we do it well because we want yeah. to. That is a piece. What it means to be Christian is to f is build community and to support each other. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. Indeed. So that's what I was. Sure. I, I thought that was my one chance at that community, yeah. and so it was very heartbreaking sure. to leave the Mormons. Um, yeah. But I. That's what it boiled down to. Is ultimately I said, okay, I've spent this time with you, and I, I feel I understand what you're teaching, and I'm not going to be on board with this. Like I, right. I just don't believe this, and I didn't want them to feel used mm -hmm. and. I just said, you know, it's time to part ways, and it was so difficult. Yeah. Um, so then also there was Jehovah's Witnesses that knocked on my door, and I spent some time in Rochester with them, and then later when I moved to the Brainerd area, I spent time with Jehovah's Witnesses again. Um, and that's that was more confusing than anything for mm -hmm. me, I think. Um, that's pretty much all I know about, about their theologies. I was just very confused. Yeah. Um, but going back to Bible college, um, and, and that feeling of being tossed around and that helplessness of watching 
my faith was as strong as ever, but at the same time kind of unraveling with mm -hmm. the logistics of we are fragmented all over the place and this isn't right. Mm -hmm. And wanting that idea of a true church, uh, this teacher, I had an ecumenical theology class. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, ecumenical theology, perfect. This is what I need before I graduate because this is going to help me with all of this. Um, and he passed out a book. And all of us were looking at this little book and we all started kind of musing out loud, John Paul II, this author, like, where have I heard that name before? And we're all like, do you know, I've heard the name, you've heard the name, right? How do we know this guy? Who is this? And finally, one of the kids said, isn't that that Pope guy that died? And we're like, yeah, a Pope. And my understanding of Popes was um, from an AP history class. Mm -hmm. So it was very political. Um, theology had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. It was always a political figure. And I knew they existed and they wore their funny little clothes. And But I didn't know they wrote. I, it blew my mind that a pope had written something. Um, so here's this book in front of me by John Paul II. And, and he wasn't sainted yet, so it was just, you know, John Paul II. And it's ut unum sint, oh. that they may be one. And so I started reading that. And as I was reading it, um, it, it was, theology came alive through that. I love theology, I love how dry it is, can, it can be sometimes, <laughs> like the, that nerd in me really comes out with theology, but this was the first time I'd ever read theology that read like poetry and was so beautiful. Oh. And so I fell in love with this guy that I barely knew the name of. And I'm, I'm reading all that he has to say and I'm just eating it up. I'm like, yes, 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 and I'm underlining highlighting, but then at the end of the book, he said, the solution's easy. Um, Protestants, we love you and we miss you. Come home. Mm -hmm. And I was furious. I was outraged because how could anybody say that about the Catholic Church? Like, that, that animosity for Catholicism was still so rampant. And it's, I threw the book across the room. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how angry I was. Mm -hmm. um, and it you know, it never bothered me to look into these other denominations at all, but to mention Catholicism like that was antagonistic to yeah, me. It's so interesting. I mean, what, what would you say it was? Was there any particular doctrines or particular aspects of Catholicism, or was it just a general In sense general, of you just don't do that? In general, everything, yeah. Okay. And, and a lot of it, too, I was talking to some people last night about how part of my journey has had to heal from some of the anger I have of people that have misled me along the way. Yeah. And I don't think they meant to. Right. They were spewing anti-Catholicism much the way I did. And you know, for me, that was honest. I truly believe that. Um, but I was lied to. I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. The Catholics do this and the Catholics do that. And um, all these horrible things mm. that, and, and it's, it's very healthy in the culture too. You know, the Reformation is not over, mm. is something that I always say. Mm. I mean, we have a culture, I always say the less liturgical a church is, the more animosity for Catholicism. Mm. That's been my general experience. Um, and so I was with a crowd that there was a lot of animosity there yeah. for, I mean, every single aspect of the Catholic Church, whether it was true or not. <laughs> right. So. So that was so that was a shocker moment to read that book. Oh, yeah. A book about unity, a book about, well, mm -hmm. a document about unity. To yep. have with that that exhortation, and how mm -hmm. could this guy be so good at theology, mm. and be a Catholic? Right, he clearly I, loves Jesus. Right, I like which how. I didn't know Catholics yeah. could do that. Yeah. Catholics don't have any relationship with Christ, so how how is this man doing this? Like it, it just really messed with my head. Mm -hmm. So gotcha. Wow. All right. So then, what happened after that? Um, <laughs> a big period that I call like the Great Desolation. <laughs> Um, there was about eight years where I had moved to the Brainerd area, and I'm very outgoing, love to make new friends, it's easy for me, but when I moved to the Brainerd area, I was just completely and utterly alone for a very long time. And I was going to church, mm -hmm. and I was trying to make friends, and I remember even during the Bible studies, um, eventually just humbling myself enough to ask people for prayer. like. Mm -hmm. I've been here two years or three years or five years and I don't have a single friend yet, not even an acquaintance. Like, mm. I see people at church, hello, that's fine. And it was, and I know God was in this. It wasn't that these people were bad people, 
but I needed to be broken down, um, unfortunately. And so I would even say in our prayer groups, can, can you pray that I just make one friend mm-hmm. or if, just go out to coffee with one person? Like they don't even have to be my best friend. I just want somebody. And, and I know this is how I know God was working because they're friendly, good people, but they would just say like, oh yeah, I'll pray for that. None of them said, why don't you and I go out for coffee? Mm-hmm. Why don't you come over and have dinner? And so it was just like incredibly isolating. Hmm. And obviously I didn't see it then. It was just horrible pain to go through. And I really felt like an absence of God. Hmm. I didn't realize how much I felt him until I didn't feel him yeah. anymore. He pulled away. And so there was eight long years there. And, and I always say, I think that was my ego being crushed to where it needed to be because I had so much hatred for the church that it took God that long to break into my heart. Um, and that's where I got an invitation from a middle school principal because of my email. I had Theology Nerd in my name. <laughs> and so he said, hey, there's this thing called Theology on Tap. Do you want to go? My wife and I will be there. And, and I thought, oh my goodness, what if I could be friends with this wife? I could have a friend here and that would be so amazing. The on tap part hadn't Mm. clicked. (laughs) And so I went to this thing. Oh, and at the end of the conversation, after I'd already agreed and been so excited, made it so clear that I wanted to go, he said, oh, I don't know if this matters, but it's Catholic. Mm. And that did matter Mm. quite a bit. I'm like, oh, he tricked me into going into this Catholic (laughs) thing. Um, But I went anyways just because I was so desperate that I would even hang out with Catholics. And... And on the way there, I made it a mission in my head. Um, Yes, I would go and I would save the Catholics. I'd become friends with them and convert them and save them from the Catholic Church. So it was like, yeah, yeah, I'm so excited to go to this. Um, The place was packed. That was shocking for me because as far as I was concerned, Catholics don't do anything other than the bare minimum of requirement because there's no relationships with Christ. So why would a Catholic show up to something on a Saturday having anything to do with theology. So right off the bat, my preconceptions were starting to just kind of be shattered and blown apart. Um, And everyone was so friendly. They weren't stuffy and cold, uh, very welcoming. And we listened to a priest talk about how he, you know, lived through this stroke and how God was there for him. And it was almost like he had a relationship with Christ. That was weird. And he used a lot of words that I didn't understand, but then he used words that I did use and understand, but in a different way. And so I'm like, okay, how, so that's what started to kind of hook me in. Like, what does that word mean to you? Because I don't think it means the same thing it means to me. And what is this word completely like breviary? What's that? Um, So afterwards, I just started hammering whoever was next to me with questions. Like, okay, what did he mean when he said this? Why does he say this? Well, why do you believe that? And they sent the RCIA teacher over. (laughs) And so we started chatting Mm -hmm. and he stayed with me until like 11 o'clock that night. And he said, you know, I teach a class where we go into this in depth and you're more than welcome to come. And this is where I started to get a little suspicious because it's Mm -hmm. like, wait, you want me to be Catholic. And so I said, look, here's the deal. Um, I've done a lot of these classes, so I might as well check Catholicism off the list, give you a fair shake. Um, like, I'll go to your dumb little class, but I just want you to understand I'm never converting. So I don't, mm. I don't want you to feel like you are wasted your time, I said. So this is a big condition of mine that you just understand. Mm. I'm here to learn and that's it. It's like, yep, that's fine. And I said, and I have one more condition. I will not do that weird voodoo thing that you guys do when you pray. <laughs> like, I won't do it. And he said, that's fine. You don't have to cross yourself. <laughs> and so that, those were my terms and my conditions of going to RCIA. And that's where things, like my theology fell apart and had to be rebuilt. Let's take a break there. (laughs) I will not do the weird voodoo thing. (laughs) That's so funny. Yeah, yeah. we had a lot of of those smells and bells and hand motions that, uh, you you mentioned uh, just before that too, that uh, even the words, sometimes, you know, not just words that you've never heard before, but even words that are just used in different ways Mm -hmm. between Catholics and Protestants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll dig in more into that. I want want to hear what happens next there. Uh, we're talking tonight to Katie Jacobson. She's a former evangelical Protestant and lots of things, you mm-hmm. know, um, kind of in that in that moniker. We're going to hear the rest of her story here in a little bit. I wanted to remind you, uh, as always, that we've got lots of stories that have been shared in this show, lots of written stories. 
If you check out chnetwork.org, we've got a whole archive there. You can find uh, stories that fit your particular background, someone who's been through what you've been through, and we'd love to share that with you. So check that out at chnetwork.org. We'll be back in a few minutes to hear the rest of Katie's story. See you in a minute. Well, welcome back to the Journey Home program. Tonight we've been hearing Katie Jacobson's story. She's a former evangelical Protestant, and her journey took her through many, many uh, different experiences and communities. We've been hearing about that. It's been a good story so far. When we left off, you just attended Theology on Tap, mm -hmm. and, and that had gotten you... It began to unravel some of this right. anti-Catholic stuff, and you were... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so what, what happened next? At, at least yeah. intrigued. Yeah. Intrigued enough to go to RCIA. Sure. Um, with, so, with caveats, with right. Very, oh yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think the first, I always think of it as like a nut cracking. Mm -hmm. Like I was a hard nut to crack, but I think the first nut, or the first crack in that nut was um, authority, uh, because I, I truly believed. I mean, I have the Holy Spirit, the authority of the Holy Spirit. You have the authority of the Holy Spirit. We all do, but also acknowledging we're all here in different things, and we're not on the same page. So what do I do with that? Um, and it was John 22, I believe, where John 20, verses 22 and 23, where Jesus breathed on the disciples. Because um, I always thought of authority as a tree and came from Jesus. And then, okay, yeah, the Catholics went this way and the Protestants went this way. So same, we all have the same authority. But that verse really changed things for me because it's just so visceral. Like it's a very physical uh, breathing on them and uh, you know you know breathing is a very important thing mm -hmm. and he's breathing something completely different into them and then telling them that they had the authority to forgive sins or not forgive sins um, that kind of blew my mind and as a good Protestant I'd read the Bible several times over obviously I even had to translate it for school how had I not seen that like what and so I, I went back to my Bible at home and it was underlined, which just put salt in my wound because there was question marks <laughs> by it. Like, what do I make of this? Mm -hmm. I brought it to my Bible study at the church that I was going to. And, and I asked my, my fellow Bible study people and they all stared at me too. And they all said, what, where's that in the Bible? I'm like, I know, right? This is crazy. And so we, they all just, none of us had answers. Yeah. What, whoa, what is this all about? And uh, so I was wrestling with that enough, and I think that's what helped me. Maybe the Catholics know a couple things. Mm. I might learn something new, whereas before I knew it all. Um, and then the Eucharist night was coming up, and I thought, well, I already know what they're going to talk about. Like, we talked about this in Bible college. And, and it was funny because it was, I truly did know everything the teacher was going to say. He didn't say anything that surprised me or shocked me yet I felt punched in the gut. Hmm. And I'm sitting there in class having this very big emotional reaction to what he's saying, and I'm confused because I already knew that. I'd heard this before, so what is going on? And I took a little break in the bathroom and I had my keys. I had snuck my keys because I might have to leave over this. Like, this is how upset I was. And I'm standing by a toilet in the bathroom, like having this mini breakdown, just like, what is going on? And I, I knew it was spiritual, but I thought, is Satan trying to trick me and trying to get me into the Catholic Church because he's tricky? Or is God trying to speak to me and pull me into the Catholic Church because it's true? And so I'm having this little crisis in the bathroom, and I just thought, I don't know what is going on. And so I just prayed and said, God, um, I don't know what to think right now. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what you're doing. I'm going to go back to class, but I don't ever have to come back again if I don't want to. Um, I'll hear this guy out. I'll hear the rest of the lesson, and I might be done. I don't know. Yeah. And so I went back to class, and after class, of course, my teacher came up to me like, how's it going? <laughs> like, um, and so I told him, I said, well, I mean, the point tonight when I go home, my whole point's going to be to destroy your argument. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm going to do, and um, I'll just be honest, you know. And he's like, oh, no, I expected that from you. 
And he said, do you happen to have Justin Martyr at home? And strangely enough, I did because, you know, where I come from, tradition's bad and um, evil and you don't read those things. So I had it, but there's no way I would have read it. Mm. And so he said, in all of your stuff you do tonight, you know, maybe, maybe read this. And so I thought, well, fine, whatever. And so I went home and I'm pulling out the Greek and I'm pulling out all my notes and I'm like, okay, what does this word mean in Greek and how do you put that in here? And so I'm doing everything in my power to absolutely destroy this man's credibility and piece by piece my ego was being destroyed mm -hmm. as I was realizing like, oh my goodness, uh, he might be right. And then I'd read a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, hopefully this will counteract what he was saying. And, and then the final straw in that one was Justin Martyr because he was talking about the Eucharist and he was talking about being the real presence. And I honestly thought that was something the Catholic Church had made up at one point or another. And that was a big part of the reason why we split because they're just making all this nonsense up. And of course it's just symbolic. Um, so to see that in 133, the real presence was being honored and what sure sounded like a mass to me was happening. It was like, oh my goodness, we are the ones that changed it. Mm -hmm. We're the ones that completely broke off of what's always been going on. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of horrifying, uh, mm -hmm. very angry. I was very angry about that. I wasn't converted in that moment, but I was upset yeah. and I felt like I knew too much to still be Protestant, but I certainly wasn't Catholic. And then that left this gaping hole because if you're a Christian, you're either Protestant or Catholic. Mm. I, what else is there? Yeah. And suddenly I'm nothing and nowhere and I don't belong anywhere. And it was so painful. And so it's like, well, I guess I'll keep going to these RCI classes and just flounder by. And I was going to church and it kind of got less and less as it seemed emptier and emptier the more that I knew, the more that I learned, um, which was awful. That was my whole identity. That was my world. Mm -hmm. And it's falling apart. Yeah. Um, it, it's always find it interesting with the Eucharist. Uh, it's interesting you had the experience of, of knowing ap apologetically, this is what the Catholics say and all that, mm -hmm. and whatever, but that you hadn't perhaps really, um, you hadn't really looked at it from within, mm -hmm. right? Like sometimes we do that. We have arguments yep. on the surface, but I don't really see what would it look. What would the world look like if what they believed yes. is true? And when you do that with the Eucharist, I, I, I think we can, under, we can understand why you have that experience because it's like, what if that were true? Mm -hmm. What if Christ gave us the Eucharist? Yeah, like that would the what if that would be is what blows your mind. I don't have that. I mean, yeah. that's so. I mean, it, it makes sense to have, to have that yeah. experience. And that's where I ended up was kind of what if. So not convinced at all, but what if? Like right. something in my knowledge isn't right here because this history, because, and I even prayed before I read Justin Murder because it's like, I don't want to take part of evil tradition, mm -hmm. but it's history. I'm just going to look at it as like a history book right. and look at it that way. And that's how I started getting into tradition is, is treating it like history, mm -hmm. uh, which was necessary. But so I figured it was probably time to go to my first mass. And I knew I'd, probably gone to a Catholic wedding at some point or a mm -hmm. Catholic funeral, but um, now with these new glasses yeah. on to watch. But I was, I was honestly, I wanted to go in and I wanted to be in the last pew and just kind of observe and watch. Yeah. But uh, the way our church was set up, there was holy water at the bottom of the stairs. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down the stairs because I didn't understand what holy water was, what made it holy. Mm -hmm. And so somebody had said the priest blesses it. It's like, well, what do you mean by blesses it? Because to me, that sounds like a spell. Yeah. Like he's putting some sort of hex on here that when you walk <laughs> past it, yeah. like what's going to happen to me? And so it was like, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. So I actually hid back behind a partition and just kind of like peeked around mm. and watched what was going on and what are people doing? And I'd asked my daughter, she'd been to a mass and she said, they sing like ghosts. <laughs> and so, you know, when you're used to the electric guitars sure. and like people waving their hands in the air, it was different to hear people chanting back and forth and saying things and and I couldn't understand what they were saying so it was a, just a an experience to watch mm -hmm. but the most poignant part of that mass is I saw my RCIA teacher he had to sneak out a little early to start class and I watched him genuflect and that's what really got me mm. um, 
that whole mass being so confusing and weird that genuflect because it was so purposeful and heartfelt and genuine and it was it made me I'd read the description of what a genuflect was I saw it in my book yes mm -hmm. but to see so clearly that he was worshiping his king yeah. that's where I was really confronted with if they're right about the Eucharist then that's the only response you can possibly have mm -hmm. but what what if they're not right I don't want to do that and commit this horrible idolatry to bread if if it's not actually Jesus. And so just that inner turmoil of, wow, I, <laughs> I have to make a decision sometime. And, and I don't know if I should do that now. And like, what if I make the wrong one right now? Like, I have to think about this. So I was just very confronted with the reality because of his genuflect. Right. And that's why I think it's so important that when we genuflect, mm -hmm. you know, instead of that half curtsy, it speaks to people. Yeah. You speak to yourself, but it speaks to others as well. Like, we are watching you. Yeah. Um, at any given time, you might have a Protestant or someone watching you very closely. I like the way so. that you put that, that. We are speaking to ourselves. Our, our, what we do with our body mm -hmm. is a sort of language, not just mm -hmm. our words, but our actions. And we, we speak to ourselves and to others mm -hmm. and how we act. And those little acts of worship, they mean a lot. They mean yeah. A lot. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. So the what if continues and gets bigger. And yes, <laughs> yep. Um, and my RCIA teacher actually invited me to be a chaperone on a Steubenville trip, mm. um, which I was like, I'm not qualified for this. But he said, hey, you can keep kids alive, right? <laughs> like, well, right. I guess so. So he knew exactly what he was doing. I didn't know this at the time, but I needed to see all of it. Mm -hmm. um, so we went to a Steubenville. Uh, they had to tell me what relics were because we were going to be visiting um, a place with a bunch of relics. And I'm like, what's a relic? <laughs> that was horrifying. Um, so uh, that experience, uh, seeing how much richness and tradition, um, and I believe it was the cathedral that we went to that had so much painted on the ceiling, um, where you've got all of these um, typology mm -hmm. out on the ceiling, and suddenly I'm making connections that I'd never made before. And so that typology just, I couldn't even tell you what was on the walls mm -hmm. or what the altar looked like or anything. I was just glued to the ceiling. So it was like, whoa, yeah. that makes sense. And I was just, my brain melted in that place, honestly. Yeah. And so, you know, that's just, I always think of it as gears, like another thunk, another yeah. thunk. Like every time I would learn something or experience something, they, they would just fall into place. Um, we had a very spiritual experience on that Steubenville trip. Uh, and there was a moment that I was was very scared, and I ran to find a priest. Um, and I thought about that later. Like, if I didn't think priests had authority, why in that moment when I got scared and panicked, why was I looking for a priest? Something in me knows and recognizes that authority that I truly believe is there. And so I had to really kind of question myself in that. Like, maybe you believe a little more than you think you do. Um, and then... So it was just a bunch of experiences like that, not having to feel like I was correcting all the time. That was a difficult thing with the Protestant churches. You know, I'd been educated and I had my my worldview, but then if we tried a new church and I would have to say to my kids, like, well, he's talking about something, you know, this predestination. We don't believe that. Um, and we don't believe this. Uh, that doesn't fit God's character. But then there's you have to carry that weight then of, well, everything I say is true. Now suddenly I'm God mm -hmm. and I'm the one saying I've got the correct interpretation of the whole history of the church. And so it's an unbearable burden to carry, especially as a parent. How do I know I'm right? I think I'm right. I'm taking educated guesses. Um, but on that trip to be able to kind of relax and not guard my amen, that was a big thing that I'd be careful not to say amen to something that I didn't believe was true. Right. And to be able to just kind of relax and enjoy the mass and just amen, you know, like mm -hmm. I didn't have to think twice about that. So that was nice to see that that load lifting mm -hmm. that I don't have to carry, you know, a couple thousand years of church history on my back. Like it's been done for me. They've figured this all out. Um, and then the final straw for me that that I said to myself, I am a Catholic in this moment. 
I had just read something about, I was thinking I was skipping ahead of my RCI stuff or something, I don't know, <laughs> about NFP mm. and how the church says like, yeah, no, don't, don't partake of birth control. And it's, it's funny because I, by that time, hated birth control. Um, I had seen what it had done to me. I had seen what it had done to my friends. Um, I've heard of people dying from the consequences of birth control on the body. So I actively hated birth control and didn't want to use it. But I still had that knee-jerk reaction of, who are you to tell me what to do with my body? Mm. And what is with this NFP business? And that was the moment where I was like, okay, I don't understand why the church teaches this, but they've been right about everything. And I've been wrong about all of it. And at some point, instead of intellectually figuring it all out and like accepting it as okay, I have to trust the church. Mm. And that was my moment where I was like, I'm a Catholic right now because I know it's going to be beautiful. I know it's going to make sense. And I'm just trusting that it'll make sense. And it did. Yeah. So that was the moment I became a Catholic and wow. I knew it. Wow. Well, what did you do with that, that knowledge? Were you still in the RCA program at that point? Um, I think by that time I might have been out of it. Okay. Um, it was kind of a long process. Mm -hmm. There was a bunch of different obstacles that kept coming up. Um, and I was working with a priest through these obstacles, but it was it was kind of a mess. And so I actually wanted to be Catholic for quite a while before I was actually mm. brought into the church. And so it was just a time of growth and learning and mm. solidifying my decision where like, yep, this yeah. is where I'm supposed to be. And even in that time, even though I wasn't Catholic, God called me um, to go share my conversion story. Uh, I started with Theology on Taps and ended up doing kind of almost like a nationwide tour. Mm -hmm. uh, I was scared to death. Yeah. I was telling those guys that in college I purposely got the degree I got so I wouldn't have to take homiletics because I would choke up and not breathe when it was time to speak in front of people. Yeah. And then God's like, you're going to go on the road and talk. <laughs> and that's what I ended up doing. It's like His grace just comes pouring out and you're like, yeah. okay, that's a surprise, but here we are. Yeah. So. And at some point in that in that time, I believe you were in contact with one of my colleagues, Mary mm -hmm. Claire Dzinski. So I, yeah. as you were working through some of that final stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, she was very helpful, very supportive, mm -hmm. just very kind. The ear that was always there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, as you said, you know, like you can become convinced, but there's still there's many levels of conversion, right? There's like kind Absolutely. of the intellectual. There's working through the doctrine, mm -hmm. uh, and and maybe even getting on board with a lot of the practices. But then there's still just like yep. the heart has to. Take yes. time to sort of catch up. And, and my heart's a lot slower. Like even mm. now, I struggle with Mary still, mm. and that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I always think it's it's interesting because no Catholic ever pressured me to mm -hmm. become Catholic. They were always very patient, mm -hmm. but I've had a lot of people pressure me about my relationship with Mary. Uh, um, you should consecrate yourself, and I'm like, nope, <laughs> I'm not there. You know, yeah. and maybe tomorrow I'll be there. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll be another thirty years. I don't know, but I'm okay with it. Like, mm -hmm. if she's as patient as you guys say she is, we're fine. Yeah. And so, and I, I love the rosary. Mm -hmm. I'm not against the rosary or anything, but, you know, it's just that background keeps kind of coming up where I was raised to be so anti-Mary. And so it's like, I just got to work through it. And intellectually, yes, I get it. She's Jesus' mother. Mm -hmm. How could I, how could I not have a relationship with her? I get it. Right. But I don't get it here yet. Yeah, yeah, and you can't force a relationship. So, any yeah. sort, you know. So, so my heart's just got to catch up. Yeah. That's all right. Well, you reminded me. Uh, we chatted about briefly before in the the NFP question. Um, in that's a great example of of nowadays something that people can kind of get intellectually, but but often in the end they say, you know what? But I, I can't fully get this, I, and I need to trust the church about this. Mm -hmm. That they're that the way I think of family life, the way I think of children, the way I right. think of sexuality. Mm -hmm. It's going to take some time for it to sink in, but yes. in the meantime, I'm going to choose to trust. To trust. Yeah. And don't be lazy. Learn about it. Um, I think that's one of my biggest pet peeves with Catholics mm -hmm. is they'll say, well, I think NFP is stupid. Mm -hmm. Well, have you read about it? Mm -hmm. No? Then you probably should. Yeah, some more you great know? documents by that JP2 yeah. guy. You know? <laughs> and if you read all of them and you still disagreed, well, then that's a different conversation, but you haven't. Right. So do your homework. Yeah. You know, And that was something that coming into the church, obviously I thought my big ministry would be Protestants and like helping my brothers and sisters in Christ come to the Catholic Church and understand 
that it's just as spirit filled, that's just as much love for Christ mm -hmm. than the Billy Mays like, but wait, there's more. <laughs> like there's so much more here. Yeah. But it's really the Catholics that have kind of captured my heart because when a Catholic asked me like, why would you convert from the place where you got lattes and electric <laughs> guitars? Like that's way more fun. Mm -hmm. Why, what, why would you be Catholic? And it's like, how can you even ask me that question? You know, so it's like, well, I mean, do you believe in the Eucharist? Like, let's start yeah, there yeah. because sometimes they don't. Right. And so it's like, you got to realize what a treasure you're sitting on here. So. Yeah. Well, there's what often comes off up on this show is just, you know, some of the God's wonderful, merciful providence amidst our brokenness. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I mean, like, you know, the, the church is divided and it's broken because of sin. Not, not something God did, something we did. Mm -hmm. But in his providence, he brings good out of those. And yep. oftentimes we're seeing in the church today that, well, that the holes that need to be filled in in our theology or our, 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 our praxis or our, our pedagogy are often brought in by, by converts. You know, like <laughs> so many of our, our children leave the church because they never met Christ. Yeah. They had all the other stuff. Yeah. They never met Jesus. Mm -hmm. you know? And so, yep. so you were working through some stuff for a time, but how did you finally uh, end up in the church? Um, I gave my priest like practically an ultimatum. It was just like, <laughs> all right, it's time. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm coming into the church, mm -hmm. and he said, okay. So I was, I wasn't brought in at Easter vigil. Mm -hmm. I was brought in a little bit earlier, um, and so it was January twenty sixth, mm -hmm. uh, two thousand nineteen, that I was brought into the church and. It was funny, six weeks later, I went started um, Theology of the Body certification out in Pennsylvania. Oh, so I like wonderful. cannonballed into the faith. Yeah. Um, that was intense. But, and, and that's where it's been. It's been like this snowball and cannonballs. And then just when I think I really get it, then there's something else completely that yeah. I learn about. I'm like, what? We do what as Catholics? And so it's, I'm still learning. Yeah. And every day that's where that conversion comes in too because you know, and I still struggle with the same things that I've struggled with where sometimes maybe my relationship with God's a little drier mm -hmm. and another times it's fired up and it's like that waxing and waning of any good relationship that happens. Um, like we have that here too and that's okay. And um, But I love the prayers. You know, where I come from, it was all just, it had to be spontaneous, Holy mm -hmm. Spirit led. One thing that I've discovered and I was warned against mm -hmm. with the Catholics was that they have these rote prayers right. and they don't mean anything. They're just, they just go through the motions. Um, but that's actually been such a, a wonderful gift for me because when I struggle in my prayer life, I even went to a pastor one time, like I was in such a low point and I said, I just, I can't pray. Like I'm trying. And he said, fake it till you make it. And I'm like, okay, I get it. But Honestly, I cannot even get the words. I can't even fake it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know what to tell me. Um, and then, uh, right, you know, as I was going through RCIA, I had a friend who killed himself. Mm -hmm. And I went to an adoration chapel because I really didn't know what else to do. I'd never been in one. And everybody was just quiet. And so I took the little rosary card and I could read that. And it was like, okay, I don't have the words, yeah. but the church has given me these words. Mm -hmm. And so I can just read this, and it's a beautiful prayer. Yeah, the so, angel's given us those words. Yeah. Mary's given us those. So yeah. I, I love the rote prayers that yeah. Catholics have because it's, it's always there for you, um, no matter where you are spiritually. Yeah. So There's so many threads I want to pull on. We'll go back <laughs> to them. Now, we've got about six minutes left. One I wanted to make sure we circled back around to is you mentioned early on uh, having kind of come into a sort of a default once saved, always saved mm -hmm. notion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which again, it's it's a point of doctrine that has a lot of practical consequences for living out the Christian life. Um, so, what did that look like? What does that look like as you've transitioned into a, a different understanding of what holiness is, what growth, what the what the journey looks like as a Christian? Talk about that for a moment. Well, I think the journey is really the key word there because we know with the once saved, always saved. Like, okay, there that grace was poured out upon you. Um, go. Mm -hmm. And so then, when you did hit these stumbling blocks or you failed miserably. It's not like there's more grace to pick you up. Mm -hmm. There's no channel of grace. It's been poured out. So why are you failing so badly mm -hmm. if Jesus' grace is all over you? Yeah. Um, but, but now as a Catholic, it's like 
I fall and I fail and which channel of grace am I going to pick today? I'm going to go to confession and I'm going to go to mass. And it's the co-working with God mm. that is so inspiring instead of me feeling like Christ is with me, but I'm doing it all myself. Um, I feel like I'm an actual co-worker with Christ, which is borderline scandalous to say <laughs> because it almost sounds like I'm elevating myself. But um, there's that idea in that Catholic Church that God wants us to work with Him. Right. He wants us to cooperate with Him, and we do have to get our give our yeses. Um, and sometimes I just wrote a post about how beautiful that yes can be and joyful, but mm. other times too, like my yes is not very happy, mm. but He takes it. Yeah. He's like, I can work with that. All right, like just be obedient. My grace is enough mm -hmm. for you, and we'll get there. Yeah, that's so. such a beautiful thing. I I I think that's a really important, more general point there, that. Uh, God does it th this way. He doesn't have to do it this way. Right. Like sometimes, yeah, we're rightly scandalized by what God does. Incarnation, <laughs> Eucharist, yes. you know, virgin birth. Yeah, we're, it's, we should be a little, there's a part of us that's like, God, God would do that? Like right. that's, isn't that a little beneath you, God? Like, right. Well, yes, it is. Exactly. It's, it's um, but God could, mm -hmm. and he has chosen to, because that's part of his fatherhood. He wants to work through us and with us, and mm -hmm. it's, that, that touches a lot of different points of contention between Catholics and Protestants is that yeah. we, we stop at the scandal, but yeah. then don't receive the gift. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, his cruciformity. I like the word cruciformity mm -hmm. because yeah. it's not that I'm elevating myself to God. It's just that he's coming down to my level. Yeah. yeah. And that's mind-blowing. Yeah. So. All right. We've got three minutes left. Tell us a little, little about what's going on in your life nowadays. What what what, what are you involved um, in? Well, I've actually I've had yeah. a lot of health problems, so I yeah. I think of my role as suffering right now, mm -hmm. um, which definitely works on my prayer life, and mm -hmm. I, I feel they're more um, powerful that way. It's it's lessons I've had to learn, and that's always how God has worked with me. Yeah. Is the more the more I suffer, the half, happier I am, and the more He does with my life. I did not come into the church easily. There was a lot of suffering. So I know something good's up. Um, and so I, I'm i waiting. I'm waiting now to see what he has in store. And I just, I share my story wherever I can. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I have spurts where I go to several different churches and share. And sometimes there's just quiet. And I homeschool my, my babies. And Wonderful. so, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, life's always an adventure. Like every day, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So I can hardly sleep sometimes at night because I'm so excited to see what God's going to do tomorrow. Oh, so That's beautiful. All right, well, let's take a minute then to, uh, to just, again, circle back and talk to those who are coming from a similar background, evangelicals, yep. uh, those who maybe see some of the issues of authority, those who, on, yeah. on the other hand, still, like Catholicism can't do that, can't right. go there. Yeah. What, what would you say to them? Just don't mm -hmm. be afraid to read. Don't be afraid to actually look into it because I think that's the biggest hurdle. We've been taught that if you read anything about the church, that you are reading man-made tradition and it's awful, mm -hmm. um, and that it's practically a sin to even think about doing that. So look into that. You know, we always want to see how the early church was. Mm -hmm. Well, it's there. It's written for us. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we never looked outside the Bible for that, and there's this rich tradition. Uh, so read your history. And that was, that was huge for me, is just the, the history of it all, that tradition, which is why I love tradition so much now, you yeah. know. So. Oh, beautiful. All right. Well, if people want to connect with you, where can they go? What can they I, pro I would say probably Instagram, okay. Wayfaring Catholic. Right. Um, that's, I'm not there often, so yeah. don't be discouraged if I don't answer <laughs> sure, your sure, message sure, right sure. away. But, but that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Katie, thank for sharing you. your story, Thanks. beautiful story. Uh, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. Uh, again, uh, it's the story. It's the journey. Uh, and wherever you happen to be on your particular journey, um, we'd love to help you uh, discover Christ in this church. Uh, please check out chnetwork.org. Uh, many uh, stories like Katie's, but from every different background. You know, there's, there's a story of somebody who's been through what you've been through, and so uh, hear their story. Be open to it. As Katie said, be open to it. Uh, be sure to check out our community at chnetwork.org as well. You know, that's a great way to, to, to walk along that journey. Uh, again, no pressure, no pushing, pulling, or prodding <laughs> here. Just be open. We want to follow Christ, and He'll lead us where He wants us to. Once again, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. We'll be back next week. God bless you. See you next time.